Okay, people. There's the screen. So I gotta kinda stick to this. Um. Today is April 18th, 2017. I'm gonna call this one My Son is Raging. But isn't it kind of funny how. Well, it's not funny, really. But isn't it kind of odd that as my kids, it's not just my son, it's everybody in the house. Raging is raging. There's this dude in the United States, right? This camera is a little low. There's this dude in the United States that... I, I don't really understand the whole story other than he broke up with his girlfriend or something and he couldn't talk to his girlfriend and, and he was feeling lonely for his girlfriend and his girlfriend broke his heart and apparently his mother wasn't really there for him in terms of like emotional um, support or something I don't know he was missing his mom and or he wanted to talk to his mom and his, he was disconnected from his mom and his girlfriend had broke his heart and <clears throat> he was just feeling completely you know abandoned by the women in his life and um, apparently he had a pretty high following on uh, Facebook or YouTube or something so he had already been out in the community and trying to do something you know say something on the internet I don't know what he was saying but anyway long story short, he, story, long story short he snapped right and uh, went on a shooting spree and just started shooting people one person for sure, some elderly man, just some random person. And then ran away after he shot them and took off and started shooting more people. I don't know how many more people he shot. I haven't really heard anything more about it other than he said he has. Whether it's confirmed or not, I don't know. Apparently some homeless people behind some, some abandoned houses or something. So it might be hard to find them. <laughs> so, anyway... Um... This is supposed to be about my my raging family, because I can't even say it's even just my son, but it doesn't help when my son jumps on the bandwagon, and he's big, right? And he's loud, and he's you know he he's a man, right? And he's like terrorizing the fucking house, right? I already lost one son to stu to stu stupidity, and now I'm losing another son to stupidity, literally. My oldest son. Decided to take up the bottle, right? Drinking, you know, 40% alcohol, vodka, straight up from the fucking bottle. And then expect n no reaction from that, right? So when his behavior change changes, he's completely oblivious to it and he's a fucking idiot. So I don't let him come around the house. Because that's not how my kids grew up. And when they act like idiots, I remind them, you didn't grow up with fucking idiots in the house. I was a stable parent. Uncle John was a stable role model, right? Now, mind you, we lost our house in 2003 because I was, uh, and this, 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 this can be proven in court, right, if it should ever come up, where the BC Lib government brought in legislation that came from actually Bill Clinton, right, that was tweaked by Bush under the welfare reform laws of the United States of America. And Gordon Campbell at the time, in 2002, 2001, had Bill Clinton come over. You know, they passed the envelope. Bill Clinton got paid. You know, he made a lot of money on his little speech, right? And Gordon Campbell implemented it into the province of British Columbia, Canada, which was the first province of all Canada to adopt such legislation. And it created instant hardship on thousands of people including my family who at the time was illegally um, cut off of welfare I was cut off boom just didn't receive a welfare check for the uh, month of February of 2003 because they gave me my last one in December of 2002 and said, if I don't go pick tomatoes in some hothouse, I'm getting cut off. And that's what they did.
because I had five ten five dependent children, right? Obviously, my daughter was um, my oldest daughter was struggling with meth addiction. At that time, I didn't even really understand what meth was. I had no concept. I had no clue. I didn't know what was coming. Okay, in terms of the uh, the addiction part of it and how it affects families and the individual that's addicted to these types of drugs, right? And my youngest was, I guess Tisha was about three and a half, something like that, three, three and a half. Lived in that house for eight years. I thought it was seven, but when I actually calculated it out, it was actually eight years I lived in that house. And it was just ripped up from underneath our feet. And I had to downsize from a five-bedroom house, right, up, up and down. You know, a yard that I invested in thousands of dollars and built an actual playground for my children with a big fort and swing set and gravel and the whole nine yards. Um, all in the space of uh, 30 days. And then I cut a deal with 15 days with my landlord right for half a month's rent gave him fifty dollars a month for a whole fucking year just to pay off that half a month's rent so i had those extra fifteen days to pack up and get out of that house that i had been in for eight years and of course my kids got caught up in that whirlwind and then we ended up in a little mini apartment two bedroom apartment i had to secure i had to secure uh, second lodging for my oldest and my my two oldest because the apartment building didn't want the five kids in a two bedroom apartment because of the fire code. Uh, although everybody had their own beds in that two-bedroom apartment, Uncle John's room with the boys was called the Little Yellow Submarine because it was long and they had Uncle John's bed with Uncle Brooks and Mark Kane's on the other side, so it was like going into a little into a little submarine. And then I was in the other room and all the kid, girls' beds were in that room, right? Everybody had their own bed. But I still had to make arrangements for my oldest daughter to be somewhere else on paper. <laughs> Right, and same thing with my oldest son. So there was the beginning of the separation of the family. Right? And it turned out they had cut me off of welfare nine months before the legislation came in to affect in terms of when they, they cut me off before it even came in and then they backdated it in under nine months. I don't know how... The, anyway, it's all there. And then from there... I only lasted two and a half months because, uh, you know, there was some water problems and just, it was a nightmare. So I got us out of there and found myself a cheap little three, three bedroom fourplex. Very run down. So of course, you know how people judge you. They judge you from the outside. My landlady was mentally ill and she had a little girl that was about the same age as Shemaine, eight years old or so. And, um... The first month I got in there, I had to call social services because she was leaving her little girl at night by herself because she used to deliver papers downtown. That was her job, even though she was mentally ill. And they'd leave, the parent, the father wasn't living there, and they were from Tamil, India, a different part of India, right? And um, anyway, social services showed up, you know, said, well, if you look after her, we'll let her stay. Otherwise, we're going to take her away from the mom. This is how it happened, people. Now, this is like within the first month. Of, now, I'm going into a month and a half, right? Because like, and they're telling me I'm going to have to move, and I just moved in. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Uh, well, you can look after the little girl, and as long as we know you're looking after the little girl, we'll let the little girl stay, and, and you can live. And that's what happened, people. I ended up living there for like three and a half years, looking after that little girl under the Ministry of Children and Family Development, who never paid me. I wasn't on welfare because I had already been illegally cut off of welfare. As my kids are being, you know, brought from a state of being stable in their life with enough room for them to grow emotionally, physically, intellectually, the, you know, the whole nine yards, right? Outside of my oldest daughter, you know, getting into her addiction, which, like I said, I didn't know what the fuck that meant until you actually go through it. But maybe if we would have stayed in that house, it would have, it would have been different. 
because what happened was as soon as I found out that what was happening to her, I brought her back. I, I pulled her out of the school system because that's where that shit comes from. And this is where it brings me back to my raging son. Oh, well, yeah. you're the parent. You're the one that screwed up Sierra. You're the one that screwed up Brooks because he's reading GMOI and he's taking it fucking personal. That's what's happening. That hate, that hate website on the Internet. It's going around saying this fucking shit just because they can type something and it can stay there as gospel. No. My daughter was introduced to crack cocaine through the public school system at one of the richest schools in British Columbia, Canada, in the Delta District. She was in a resource room for two years under the program of, well, she's a special needs child, so we're going to move her over here, right? And they put her into this resource room with 12 other kids, 13 other kids that were all on Ritalin or something, except for my daughter, because I insisted that she not go in there with drugs. All right? Because they didn't want to keep her in the mainstream, so they put her in there. And as soon as she got into grade 8, they switched her over to the school next to it, which was middle class and high school, like middle school and high school. And within halfway through grade 8, she was introduced drugs on the school site. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know anything about it until I started to see the behavior to change. And by the time I seen the behavior to change, it was already too late because it was in the fucking community. It was across the street with some native dude with his kids that he should never have had his kids because he was beating his damn kids and he was screwing his kids' friends. And these kids were like 11, 12, 13, 14 years old. Running down, riding his bike down the path with his tomahawk because some kid owes him 20 fucking dollars for some dope. And you know what? The cops never did anything about that dude. And the social workers sure in the hell never did anything about that dude because he played the native card. That's what happened. He murdered, he murdered some man, was in jail for like 12, 20 years, whatever, got out of jail. The wife, the, the mother died. He got the kids. And he just basically abused those kids and poisoned the rest of the kids in the neighborhood while I'm running around at 4 o'clock in the morning trying to get my daughter back home. Trying to understand what the hell was going on with her. As I got my 25, 6-year-old son today screaming at me that I'm the one that created that fucking problem and that I'm the one with the bad attitude and I'm the one that's a bad parent and I'm the one that never fucking worked in my life because now he's finding out that he's a man and he has to go out there and fucking work. Or you die. You either work or you die. Blaming me. Because he went to school for six years and fooled around with it in terms of just... I asked him when he first went into the system. I know he's watching my videos. He'll rage on me. Whatever. When he first went into the system. Because he blamed... Well, you told me to go to school and now it's my fish. All your fault that I didn't do very well and I'm $90,000 in debt. If I wouldn't have listened to you, I would have been working and being a homeowner today. Because all my other friends did that. You fucked up my life, Mom. You're not even my mom anymore. I'm not even going to call you mom. And when I leave, I'll never fucking see you again because I have no mother. But if you notice, he's under my roof. Oh, you didn't make this house. Uncle John did. It's all Uncle John made this house. Yeah, okay. Uncle John made this house. Uncle John helped make decisions in this house, but he didn't make this house. I made this house. That's why this house is still standing. That's why Uncle John moved in with me. Because I could make a house. And just because you make a house doesn't mean you can keep the freaking house. You have to work at keeping in the house. Something that my kids don't want to do because they're all self-imploding, feeling sorry for themselves, and then accusing me of feeling sorry for myself when I put the point blank blame on the government in terms of how the government's legislation has influenced the lives of my children. You wake up one day, you lose your house. Illegally lose your house. Because that was the first, one of the first money grabs that started to occur in this province. They went after the weakest of the weak. Vulnerable children and vulnerable women. Vulnerable elderly people. 
But like I said, Uncle John was targeted. Because they had no problem cutting me off of welfare. They had no problem having me look after a little girl for three and a half years where it didn't cost them not even one red cent other than to keep the fucking file open. And you know how that one ended? Near the end, this is how it ended. I was moving out, finally, getting out of that fucking hole, right? And I told the mother... I tried. To, I even tried to get the mother some help and all this, but that's a different story. But when it was time to leave, I told the mother, you cannot leave Gary by herself. You got to get secondary daycare at night before I leave because I will not leave until I know that she's not left alone. Right? And nothing happening, nothing happening. I phoned up a social worker. I told him I was leaving. I'm not going to watch her no more. Right? You guys need to make sure. You know what they told me on the phone? Oh, don't worry. You just leave, and when you're gone, we'll catch her. We'll sneak around one night, and we'll see if Gari is sleeping there downstairs in the basement by herself. And if she does, then we'll catch her. I went livid, people. I'm serious. I went livid. I screamed on the phone. I told them to get their asses down there, right? Otherwise, it was, it was going to be a war. I wasn't going to leave. I'd be phoning all the time, right? They needed to do their jobs. So they, eventually they came and they made the mother make sure that she had secondary health, like secondary daycare, so that when I left, Gari wouldn't be left at night by herself while her mother went downtown on a bus and delivered papers at four in the morning. Sick, mentally sick, right? And uh, I ended up leaving. And I went into an apartment because living living where I was was too hard to get out into the community and do anything because obviously everybody judges you from the outside. So if you're living in a broken down shanty shack with a crazy lady in the basement, then what kind of response do you think I'm going to get? So I moved into this apartment thinking, oh, it's a big gene pool of volunteers, right? Boy, what a surprise that one was. I ended up moving into one of the poorest apartments of all of Surrey. Not like I knew. And not only that, but it had a high level of mental illness on the property within its residential population. Which, again, I didn't know anything about until I got there. But my son had his own room. My son, and this is what I just recently reminded him. Because he seems to think he's risen himself since he's been eight. I never had problems with my son. Really, until he turned about 22, 23. After they took Andre. That's when he started having his little outbursts. I say to him, you never had fucking tantrums when you were little. Why are you having them now? Like, uh, right? I said to them the other day, if I was your father, I'd grab you by the scruff. Oh, no. He goes like this. No, you, you said this. You said this. I said, no. I said this. There's a difference between this and this. So get it straight. Oh, I own my shit. I own my shit. Well, if you fucking own your shit, then fucking listen. Why are you stressing your mother out? Like, why? What? If you're so unhappy, I tell him, if you're so freaking unhappy, well, just leave. But I want to buy a car first. I'm not leaving. Get me evicted through the paperwork. You know, take me to Landlord's and Tennessee Act Branch. If you really want me out of here, Mom. <coughs> I'm not obligated to make it easy for him to buy a fucking car. He's not making it easy for me. <coughs> I told him, Uncle John left home when he was 17 years old. His dad threw him out. If I was your dad, I'd throw your ass out. We'd be scuffed. Well, yeah, I'd teach my dad a lesson. Yeah, I see, you think so. I, you, you think you, your dad would be the first dad to be wrestling you to throw you out the fucking door with your bad attitude? Because you're mad? Because you didn't want to take my advice to be a computer programmer? I didn't ask you to go to school to be a freaking teacher. Art wanted that. But if that's what you wanted to do, I didn't stop you from doing it. And I didn't critique you when you, halfway through that process, decided to do something else in college. 
But I will stand up for you and say that I understand how difficult it is to study when your brain is in freaking turmoil and crashing and clashing with the nonsense that the BC Liberal government perpetrates upon the most vulnerable in this society based on economics and where you can get the most dollars. I was off of welfare for six years, people. And through that whole time, I worked on a non-profit. And through that whole time, my son had his own fucking room. I didn't. I had to bunk up with the girls. Good or bad, it didn't matter. Obviously, Uncle John had his own space, right? That was important because he was a man. And I take that same, I took that same principle and I applied it to my son. And by that time, my oldest son had already kind of forged his own way. But as he was forging it and took a fucking detour with the bottle, he kind of sabotaged himself. He ruined himself. I didn't ruin him. So I don't appreciate my younger son coming to me and doing a GMOI. Oh, you, you're a lousy mom. You didn't do well with your daughter. You didn't do well with your son. And it uh, doesn't look like you're doing well with anybody else around this house. So we might as well just trash it and destroy it and just, you know? So that's where I'm at. I'm battling my son. My youngest son now. Right? Because he seems to think being aggressive is manly. Right? Personally, I think a lot of it's being influenced by the, the computer. I think there's more subliminal messaging going on than we'd like to admit to ourselves as we uh, go on the internet and, you know, do the things that we do. Because these people that control the internet are playing games with the internet. They're using the, in the internet to uh, manipulate your personality, whether it's through Facebook with those feeds that, you know, hi to low, hi to low, hi to low, hi to low. You can make a phone call today or look at something on the internet, or not even have to use the internet. You can do something, you know, or whatever, talk on the phone or whatever, and then go on the internet tomorrow and find out that, you know, they're now advertising for something that you were just talking about on the fucking phone yesterday. Just to derail you on a subconscious. It's not an unconscious, and it's not a conscious. It's at a subconscious level. And just as easily as they can uh, bring in subliminal messages through TV commercials and that type of thing and the flash of an eye, they can do this stuff on the internet, and they do. And I do. I think it, it, I think, I think it um, influences the behavior of the population. Because where all of a sudden did this hard on for I hate mom come from? As I'm sitting here listening to about some guy that snapped because he couldn't talk to his mommy. And his girlfriend ditched him, probably because he was being a fucking dirty asshole. Right? Unless, of course, he was perfect. Oh, it's just stupid, people. It's just stupid. Like I said, I'm 55 now. Do you honestly think I'm going to be sitting here talking to this bullshit in the next five years? Should be interesting to see what I'll be talking about in about five years from now. And yeah, just for the record, I do remind my kids, like I said, this fucking internet has warped people. Like, seriously. You can see it just with the feeds, just with the violence and and the, just just all of it, you know, just you know the apathy and just anyway. Um, what what I want to say is, oh, what was it that I wanted to say, man? There's something I wanted to say. Oh, hold on a minute. All right, I got this. Got to start my day yet, right? Um, this is what I remind my kids when they're acting stupid, right? First of all, they're old enough they can leave. Seriously. Right? I can manage. I'll rent out those rooms. I was renting out rooms before they were even born. 
Something they seem to forget. Oh, well, everything you got is because of Uncle John. Listening to that GMO eyesight. As if I had nothing before he moved in, right? As if I had no hand in scrounging around at spring cleanup, bringing shit home. As I had no hand in... Oh, and that's another thing. Uh, accusing me of being a crackhead. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, look around you. Does it look like the environment of a crackhead? Right? Like, how dare you even say such a thing to me? You didn't grow up with violence. If Uncle John would have been violent, Uncle John would have not been in their life. Bottom line. I had to remove myself from violent relationships so that my kids didn't grow up with violence. But for some reason, my kids seem to think that just because they see this shit on the internet and they're so desensitized to it and that it's okay to um, act like idiots because they could throw their arms around and push something over and break something and have a tantrum as an adult. I mean, it's not happening, people. It's not happening. It's not happening. And I'm telling them, it's not happening. If you can't handle your frustrations in life, and you want to go around breaking my shit, right, then, yeah, you, you're going to get thrown out. Right? And, but then, it, it goes back to that plan, where the poorest get pushed out, chipped away at, little by little, have their loved ones taken away from them through that human slave trade, right, that's legalized through the justice system and whatnot, through the government itself, through legislation. And it's for the benefit of propping up the union sector, the government union sector, right, in terms of um, gaining wealth for, the, for that population group, which is very small minority. There's only something like, there's less than 400,000, less than, I think it's like 368 or 398,000 government employee, 100,000, 300, and, we'll just say, we'll just say 400,000 government employees across the province of British Columbia, Canada, 400,000 across the province of British Columbia, Canada, and there's uh, 4.6 million people. Do you understand? The, the provincial government union sector is just a very small fraction out of 4.6 million people when you look at 400,000 employees. But yet it's those 400,000 employees that take up the majority of the money. Because even when you go into their budgets and you look at their budgets, a large portion of that money goes into wages, benefit packages, disability packages, union um, uh, pen pension plans, and life insurance policies. It does. If you look at it for what it is. City of Surrey, through the school board, will get $320 million. We're basing this on 2002 budget. I haven't looked at it lately. $320 million will go into the union wages, where $22 million goes into capital upgrade or maintenance. So you do the math. Well, our kids are being introduced to hard drugs at an early age, from, the, from grade 7 and up. I was just telling my other daughter the other day that when I was 13 years old, the worst that we would be doing is trying to smoke a tea bag. Nowadays, kids are coming into methamphetamine at age 8, 11, 12, 13, 14. Whose fault is that? That's not the parents' fault, especially when they get the drugs at school, right? So before my son rages around here calling me a bad parent and wants to jump on the bandwagon of Rumerville because he's pissed off with his own fucking life, right, and doesn't like the fact that he has to grow up and go to work and be a man if he wants to survive, right? And then stand there and accuse his mom of not being there for him, even though he's still under his mother's roof. Regardless of whether Uncle John helped to make it or not, it's still my house, and my kids can't stand that when I say it to them. They can have everything in this house when I'm dead, and they'll be grateful that I hung on to it. Right? 
Because that's the only thing that they're going to have. And there's enough here that they can share among themselves. Right? And I don't think any crackhead would be interested in that concept. So they need to jump off that bandwagon too. Right? Because they got to blame something or somebody for their for their bad decisions. Even though I know a lot of those decisions that are being you know, made in a bad way are being influenced by a negligent government that attacks vulnerable families and exploits them. So my thing is, if you didn't grow up with it, don't think that you can run around this house acting like that because your time will be very limited. The clock is ticking. It's ticking over here, it's ticking over there, and it's ticking over there. And I'm tired of my kids trying to beat me up for failed policies that destroy families and exploit old people for their assets. I put a little article up in my last video there, the one with the black coat, right, where uh, it, through the ombudsman with enough complaints, uh, uh, something just came out in, in February of this year, uh, which was just, what, two months ago, where it's been determined that there's uh, widespread abuse of people losing their assets, like I said, through the public guardian trustee, because that's normally how they do it, especially if you're looking at houses for sale. John didn't own any houses. He had no stocks and bonds. He had nothing. All he had was his pension plan. The minute he dies, he has nothing. But his family didn't know that. They thought he had a superannuation life insurance policy. So it was worth the gamble for them to take him and do what they did, hoping that they would find it. And because there was no house involved, no stocks and bonds, no gold bullion and all this other shit, the public guardian trustee wasn't interested because they wouldn't have made enough money protecting Uncle John. So while the reality of that sinks in, my kids are going nuts. And they're taking it out on me. So, what's my solution? Well, I'm waiting for them to move out. Right? There's a couple of them on that fucking list. Who I'm going to rent the room out to after the fact? I don't know. I don't know. I just know that that's where I'm at in my life right now. I got another idiot fucking son that wants to run around acting like a fucking wounded animal and then blame me for it. <laughs>